Duncan. I'm chair of the Engineers Ireland West Region Committee. And today I'm delighted to uh, host this week's installment of uh, the Sustainability Grand Tour. Uh, tonight we have um, speakers from SEAI, Dennis Dineen, and uh, two speakers from Thermo King um, in Galway, um, in the heart of the West Region, Alan Heenahan and Wayne Donlan. Um, and they're going to speak about their experiences and the work they've been doing relating to energy usage and efficiency uh, in Irish industry. And so this is, before we start, the Sustainable Grand Tour has been running uh, for over 10 weeks now. And uh, we have a total of 18 events, um, which is hosted by uh, 10 sectors of, within Engineers Ireland. The main aim of the series is to demonstrate how engineers can integrate sustainability and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals into their projects at all stages uh, from design to end of life. And the remaining topics in the Sustainability Grand Tour uh, are listed on the slide um, with the last one uh, on protecting biodiversity um, that's been led uh, by the West Region and the Energy and Climate Action uh, Division of Engineers Ireland. Um, this is under public consultation at the moment, so if anyone's interested in contributing to, uh, to this event, uh, please let us know. Uh, our first speaker tonight will be Dennis Deneen of SEAI, um, and I'll hand you over now to Dennis. Thanks, William. Uh, let me just share my screen there now, and hopefully this works. So hopefully you can see my presentation in presentation mode. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for the invitation to uh, speak here today. So uh, my name is Dennis Deneen. I work with the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. Uh, so many people probably know SEI best for the, the work we do, kind of providing practical supports to businesses and to homeowners to um, implement and adopt clean energy technologies. For instance, uh, we would give out a lot of grants for people to insulate their homes or to buy EVs or offer other kind of practical supports to businesses. And that's really a very big part of, of what SEI does, what its remit is. But another aspect maybe not so well known of what SEI does is that we provide um, a lot of expert advice and, and information and data to the government uh, and also just to kind of society and to the, um, more generally uh, on energy and on the sustainable energy transition. Um, so there's a couple of ways we do that. We have a, an active R&D team, for instance, that works with industry and with uh, universities to promote uh, research and energy related topics. We have uh, an energy modeling team that specializes in looking forward and projecting energy out into the future. We have a behavioral economics unit, which do a lot of interesting work looking at the more kind of behavioral side of, of how you incentivize people to kind of adopt the kind of technologies and behaviors that we want to see more of. And then there's the statistics unit where I work. So we're responsible for producing the official national energy statistics for Ireland. So for example, we would meet Ireland's um, legally um, international reporting requirements for energy use to Europe or to the IEA, the International Energy Agency. Um, and then the, the data we produce would then feed on to, for instance, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, who produce Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions inventories. So a lot of our work would underpin that, for instance. Um, as well as those kind of international reporting, we also have a lot of public facing reports that we do each year. And all of our reports generally are written for a general audience. So we, we try to, the aim is for them to be very accessible and, and kind of educational and useful to, uh, you know, almost anybody really with an interest uh, in energy. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I'd encourage anybody to go on to our website. Um, I'll just give it a plug here. So uh, the general one is scei.ie. Uh, and then our section is on the top ribbon there on the right hand side is data and insights. And in, under that, you'll see an energy statistics section and this is kind of um, the landing page for our, our section then. So you'll see all of our publications there under the key publications section on the right. Uh, we've published some interesting monthly data, for instance, on electricity generation and gas data. Uh, and then we have a key statistics section, which gives a bit more detail on 
um, all of the kind of major topics of interest in energy. So for instance, transport, renewables, CO2 emissions, uh, and you, it's the sections there that go into a bit more detail and provide uh, useful information that you can download on each of those. So yeah, it'd be great. Um, please do go and see if you find anything useful. So today, um, I want to kind of give an overview really of the kind of recent trends in the last kind of number of years and some kind of spot trends for 2019 on energy use uh, kind of broadly in Ireland. Um, so um, <clears throat> some of the kind of headline figures from last year. So 2019 is the, is the latest data we have. We, we published data uh, one year in Arrear. So at the end of last year there in 2020, we published the, the final figures for 2019 energy use. And so that's what most of the presentation today will relate to. I'll say a few words at the end on 2020, which is obviously a very uh, interesting and uh, different year with COVID. Uh, and that had some you know, major effects on energy use in some areas and, and maybe not so much in others. And I'll just touch on that briefly. But most of the presentation today will be kind of the business as usual world that existed uh, up until the end of 2019. So up until the end of 2019, um, in 2019, uh, overall energy use declined by 1.2% uh, uh, and energy rate and emissions declined by 4.5%. Uh, those might sound like very big numbers, but actually that was the biggest uh, annual reduction in energy rated CO2 emissions that we had seen since back in 2011. Uh, and back in 2011, the reason for the, the sharp reduction was all down to the recession and to those effects on um, the, the economy and, and on energy use. Whereas in 2019, we, we managed to achieve those uh, emissions reductions uh, in a time when the economy was growing reasonably strongly. So uh, we look at economic growth um, as measured by modified domestic demand, which is a slightly different indicator than GDP, which is a more common one. but. Uh, for Ireland, GDP has a, a whole kind of host of potentially um, factors that um, don't really relate to the underlying activity in the economy. So, you know, for some years, we, we, we in the recent past, we have seen GDP grow uh, very strongly, double digit growth, which is, um, you know, not in any way normal. Um, so modified domestic demand gives a, a more kind of accurate uh, look at the activity in the underlying economy and and 3.2 percent is very strong growth uh, kind of internationally speaking uh, in 2019 and so we still managed to see this reduction in co2 emissions so that was uh, definitely a good news story um and really it is that kind of middle figure the energy rated co2 emissions that is really the main kind of metric and the main figure that we're, we're interested in for the for the obvious reasons of the um ongoing uh, climate crisis and, and the efforts that we need to do to transition to a, a sustainable low carbon future. So that's really the, the key thing we're looking at. Uh, and just to give a bit more context on that uh, and how energy related emissions fit in our overall greenhouse gas emissions um, picture. So internationally about probably 80% in say in the EU context of um, greenhouse gas emissions come from CO2 that's released from the burning of fossil fuels for energy use. In Ireland it's a bit lower, uh, about 59 or 60% in any given year of uh, our greenhouse gas emissions come from burning fossil fuels for energy. Uh, most of that is, is CO2 that's released um, from burning uh, fossil fuels. And then there's some amount of non-CO2 gases, like for instance, um, nitrogen dioxide and things from um, cars, from transport. Um, but mostly it's, it's energy related CO2. Uh, and that's the bit that uh, we focus on in our statistics. Uh, and then the other side of it then, um, the non-energy uh, rated CO2 stuff, uh, the EPA look at. Um, and uh, the reason why energy is a, a, a slightly smaller slice of the pie in Ireland uh, compared to internationally uh, is the kind of oversized share that agriculture has in Ireland. So internationally, agriculture might typically be 10% of a country's greenhouse gas emissions, but in Ireland it's 34%. So that poses uh, kind of particular challenges for Ireland when we look at reducing our overall greenhouse gas pie, but we in SEI, we very much just focus on the energy related CO2 one. Uh, and so that's what the rest of the presentation will look at is that, that uh, slice. But it, but it does just highlight the um, scale of the importance, you know, 60% of all our greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a very important part of the picture. Um, often when we look at um, energy use or, or energy related CO2 emissions, one of the useful ways that we can kind of split that out uh, or talk about it further is to consider three different ways that we use energy uh, in our lives and society. And those three ways are heat, transport and electricity. So they represent kind of three distinct modes of, of energy use. Um, so when we look in a bit more detail at where um, we're avoiding that CO2, we saw that overall CO2 reduction, we can see that 
in the longer term trend um, from 2005, um, all three were reducing from, say, the height of the Celtic Tiger in about 2008 down to a period in the middle there, which is about 2014, when we kind of started emerging from recession. And then once we started emerging from recession, we saw a fairly strong rebound in transport uh, energies and CO2 emissions there. You can see that in the top blue line. Um, also from 2014, we saw a gradual increase year on year in heat energy use and CO2 emissions. So heat, uh, CO2 emissions increased every year between 2014 and 2018. And they actually reduced slightly in 2019. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a bit further about that. And we can see that uh, electricity is where we've made most of our progress. And, and especially there in the last few years, since 2016 in particular, we've seen a very strong reduction in the amount of CO2 emissions from energy use for electricity. Uh, so that's where uh, a lot of our success has been, and I will look in a bit more detail at why that has been. But when we look at that overall CO2 reduction figure that we achieved in 2019, um, some of it was to do with heat, but the majority of it was of it was in electricity generation. Um, so looking in a bit more detail than at each of those sectors. Uh, so as I said, electricity is, has been the main success story, and, and we might as well start off looking at that. So the uh, total emissions from uh, CO2 emissions from electricity generation fell by 41% between 2005 and 2019. So that's an absolutely massive reduction. We haven't seen a reduction of that scale in, in any other sector or of the economy really, or in mode of energy use. Um, and there's been two real reasons for the that um, <clears throat> reduction, and that's that's the that's the total reduction. So that's even in the we've had a growth in the actual overall electricity use in that time period, but even still we've had an over forty percent reduction in the CO two emissions. So there's, there's two main reasons for that. Um, the first has been the very steady and very significant growth in renewable uh, generated electricity in that time period. So from 05 to nineteen, the amount of um, renewables use for electricity generation increased by you know 550 um, percent and a lot of that was wind wind has been the main source of growth in electricity and, and wind is a real success story in ireland uh, so we're world leaders in integrating large amounts of wind onto our system and um, we're second only to denmark um, and whereas Denmark is quite an interconnected system and can rely on Germany for large amounts of imports, we're integrating, you know, these very large amounts of variable renewables onto, a, a, you know, much less interconnected, almost an isolated grid. And so we're really world leaders in that and an awful lot of credit goes to Airgrid um, in the work that they're doing to, to do what many people wouldn't have thought was possible uh, in terms of, of getting wind on the system. So that's, that's a big part of the reason why we've been successful in electricity. Uh, and in more recent years, um, another really big cause for reduction in electricity CO2 emissions has been this very dramatic reduction in coal use. Um, so coal use is down 89% between 05 and 19, but actually most of that reduction happened just in the last three years since 2016. So since 2016, coal use is down by about 86%. So coal, uh, in electricity, we only have one coal generating power plant uh, in Ireland, that's Money Point in County Clare, but it's, it's a relatively big plant. Um, and starting from 2016, there's kind of two main reasons why we've seen a reduction in coal. Initially, Money Point was having some technical problems with their boilers. Um, so actually the plant was just offline for large portions of the year and that caused a reduction. But in more recent times, um, the it's more down to the high ETS price. So, um, Large um, power stations like Money Points are included in the EU emissions trading scheme. So they have to pay a price for the carbon that they produce that's set at an EU level. Uh, it's a cap and trade system. So there's a market for carbon there at an EU level. And the price of that has gone to record levels in the last few years. So for many years, the, the market was a bit dysfunctional and the price of carbon was only you know, seven, 10 euros a ton. But now uh, in the last year or two, it's gone to 20 to 30 euros a ton. Uh, and even now more recently up to 40 euros a ton. So at those prices, coal simply becomes uh, uncompetitive with competing sources like gas to be used for base load generation. So we just see coal slipping out of the merit order and being replaced by other forms of generation like gas or actually in recent years in renewables because there's been just such strong growth in renewables that uh, a lot of the shortfall in coal has actually been replaced um, by wind. Um, and so that's kind of got a double whammy effect on, on the electricity system. First of all, coal is um, 
very inefficient. It's only about just under 40%, kind of high 30s percentage efficiency in generation. So the less coal you use, uh, you just have less energy use for electricity overall. Uh, so you see, um, you know, uh, yeah, less primary energy use for electricity, but also coal is um, one of the most polluting forms of fuels that you can uh, use anywhere or specifically in electricity. Um, so when we see this re replacing coal, the dirtiest fuel with uh, effectively wind, which is zero carbon, that's a, a massive net gain in, in terms of the uh, avoided CO2 emissions and electricity generation. So that's really where we've seen a lot of the improvement there. Um, I suppose one kind of note of caution there is that because we've seen such dramatic drops in coal use almost down 90%, that's not something we can replicate year on year. That's not going to be something that will keep delivering for us every year out to 2030. We've, we've almost fully cashed in the kind of benefit we can get from uh, reducing coal use. Uh, there's not much of it left on the system. And so it'll get incrementally harder to achieve those kind of reductions in, in uh, CO2 emissions from electricity generation over the next 10 years, because um, as we uh, increase our renewable energy use will probably be more replacing gas which is a much cleaner fuel so um, you don't get as much bang for your buck as you do from replacing coal. Um, in terms of where we use electricity generation uh, in 2019 services uh, was the single biggest sector uh, so that includes commercial and public um, services sectors so it's offices it's data centers for instance it's um all the electricity used in public services like um pumping water in street lighting uh, all that kind of stuff that's the single biggest one that's 42 percent homes is the next biggest 28 percent and then industry is about 26 percent of all our electricity use uh this graph illustrates some of the the trends i was just talking about in the last slide so this shows um Electricity, final energy is the top line in blue. So that's the electricity that's actually used um, by end users in the in society. This graph is um, is expressed as a as basically a percentage or an index relative to 2005. So 2005 is 100, and then uh, as you go up or down, it's, it's just basically expressed as a percentage relative to that. So we can see that um, the amount of electricity that we've used uh, in 2019 was 17% higher than in 2005. But the, the middle line here is what we call primary energy. So that's actually the inputs to electricity generation. So even though we use 17% more electricity, we're actually using 12% less fuels to generate that electricity. And that comes down to that um, factor I just mentioned there that we're using less coal and coal is very inefficient and we're replacing that with 100% efficient wind. So we have to use much less fuels to generate the same amount of electricity. So that's a big benefit. And then the even bigger benefit, as I said, was in CO2 emissions. So although we're using 17% more electricity, we're um, emitting 41% less CO2 emissions. Uh, so that's a, you know, a very significant improvement there. So moving then on to heat. Um, so heat emissions, as, as I said in that in, uh, opening slide, uh, generally they've been increasing since 2014. Um, they dropped in 2019, but there's, um, which you know is good, but at the same time, there's kind of a, a bit of nuance there. So heat, uh, more so than the other sectors, uh, can be a bit spiky from year to year. It shows more kind of intra-year variations, and that comes down to the weather. So if you have a particularly cold year, you'll see a spike, and similarly, then if you have a especially mild year, you'll see a drop. Um, and what we saw was 2018, uh, you might remember back, was actually the year that we saw a very significant cold event in the kind of around this time of the year. Back then, we had the beast from the east. So to, uh, heat energy use was up significantly in 2018. And then 2019 was a more normal uh, year uh, weather-wise. So we, we just saw a reduction relative to 2018, but most of our reduction was just, was just weather-related. So it, it's too early to say if there's... Um, that's you know reduction is part of some kind of longer term trend in, in that we're moving in the right direction or it could just be a, a one-year blip based on the weather as i said the, the kind of longer term trend has been for increasing as uh, energies and co2 emissions from heat going back to when we emerged from recession in 2014. Uh, in terms of where we used uh, heat actually this um the sections here on the right this actually sorry shows the emissions from heat so 50 percent of all the co2 emissions from energy used for heat are from homes um, so that's, that's might surprise you, but that's quite a big number. Um, it's it's more than the energy that's used from homes because the uh, energy use that we use for heat in our homes um, has a high percentage of the most polluting fuels. Uh, so it has a high percentage of things like coal, peat, and oil 
compared to, for instance, industry, which uses more gas, which is um, less carbon intensive. So, uh, yeah, our homes are responsible for, you know, almost half of all uh, CO2 emissions resulting from uh, heat use. Uh, but they were down 7% in 2019. But again, that was largely weather related. Uh, similarly, industry is the next biggest chunk. It's about 31% of all uh, CO2 emissions resulting from heat use uh, down 2% in 2019 and services then is about 14%. So uh, most, a lot of energy use and services uh, is electricity. Uh, even in some cases they, um, in the services sector, people would use electricity for heating, uh, but actually where that's the case, that energy is counted under electricity and not under heat. So that's why the, the heat here really refers to direct energy use for heat. So using gas in your boiler, as opposed to using uh, electricity for uh, an electric heater, for instance. Um, just showing the same kind of uh, long-term trend then that we showed for electricity. So the top blue line there shows the uh, energy th um, that we used for heat uh, back from 2005 to 2019. So as I said, you see, do you see these spikes in cold years? So 2008, 2010 was a particularly cold year, uh, but overall there was a reducing trend um, from kind of, um, yeah, the mid 2000s during the recession down to about 2014. And then overall, uh, there has been an upward trend in the energies since 2014, albeit, as I said, with this um, downtick slightly in 2019, but really that's just down from uh, an artificial high in 2018. Um, what we see also in this graph is the uh, energy related CO2. Again, it's, ex it's expressed as a percentage relative to 2005. So we were down, used 13% less energy for heat in 2019 compared to 2005, but we used uh, 22, or we emitted 22% less CO2. So there has been um, an improvement there in the carbon intensity of the fuels, but not on the same kind of scale that we've seen for electricity generation. Uh, if we look at the, the reason for that slight improvement in the uh, carbon intensity of the fuels that we use for heat, uh, this shows that the fuels used for heat in that time period. So we can see there's a very significant drop in oil use um, and actually gas has increased throughout the period. So actually most of the reduction in the carbon intensity of uh, fuels used for heat has been because of this switching that happened between oil uh, to gas. And most of that happened in industry actually. Um, so that's really been more the reason there has been an increase in um, in renewables also, um, but uh, most of the reason is actually the switch from oil to gas. So we can see that back in 2005, you know, almost 60% of all uh, energy used for heat was oil and only 25% gas. And actually in the latest figures now, they're basically identical. Uh, and gas is, looks set to um, outstrip oil as the, as the main fuel used for heat uh, in the coming years. Finally then, uh, moving on to transport. Um, so transport, is probably of all the sectors is the one that's been most uh, tied to economic growth and the most responsive to it. So since we emerged from recession in you know, about 2012, 2013, uh, transport emissions have actually increased by 24%. So that's, that's very strong growth. Uh, and that's the real main driver of the growth in energy rated CO2 emissions that we've seen in the last kind of decade. Um, so uh, transport remains almost entirely dependent on oil. So 96% of all transport energy use is related to oil. That's again, you know, uh, unique compared to the other sectors, which uh, show more of a, a blend of different fuels, but transport is still uh, very, very dependent on that single fuel source. Um, if we look at, you know, what are the main sources of transport energy use? Um, so might not surprise people to see that cars are the single biggest uh, energy user and CO2 emitter for transport, about 40% of uh, energy related emissions from transport in 2019. It might surprise people to find out that the next largest chunk is actually aviation. So uh, about 21% of uh, energy rated emissions from transport in 2019 were from planes and, and aviation has seen very significant growth up until 2019, but of course, uh, very significant contraction in 2020. So it'll be interesting to see what the longer term trend in aviation energy use is. Uh, and then the next biggest uh, chunk is uh, road freight, uh, which is 15%. Just to highlight again, this um, figure of 96% of our uh, energy use from transport being from oil. So this shows the, the fuel mix from uh, transport in 2019. Uh, so we can see that 96.3% yeah, of all um, energy use in transport is, is fossil fuels, almost entirely oil. Um, 
what people may not realize actually is that uh, anytime you fill up petrol or diesel at the pump for your car, um, that a portion of that is biofuels. Um, uh, so actually the government mandates uh, every year that uh, suppliers of transport fuels have to blend a certain amount of biofuels into their fuels. So it's largely an invisible measure, but it, it does add up to a significant amount of biofuels. Uh, uh, but it's still only 3.6% of, of the transport energy. And then there's still a, a very marginal amount of electricity use. Um, and actually most of that electricity is for things like Dart and Lewis. Um, and then electric vehicles are, are just a fraction of 0.1%. Um, they're less than half of that, but growing strongly. So it really highlights the scale of the challenge we face in transport, that, that entire 96.3% blue block there. We have to find a way to either eliminate or replace that entire chunk of, of energy use uh, to move away fossil fuels to some sort of clean energy alternative. Uh, so very significant challenge in transport. It really is the kind of the big challenge facing us. Uh, and again, just showing that graph um, that shows the trends in uh, energy and CO2 emissions over the last, since 2005. Um, so as I said, transport is the most responsive to the economy. So we saw a very strong growth uh, throughout the 90s up until the, the peak in uh, 2007 in transport and energy use. But then we saw that the sharpest contraction in, in energy use and CO2 emissions of any of the sectors during the recession. And now again, we've seen the, sharp, the strongest growth uh, since 2012. Uh, but we're actually more or less back to where we started in 2005. So we're 3% more energy use for transport in, in 2019 than in 2005 but on an increasing trend. Uh, and as I said, we compared to heat or, or electricity, we haven't seen any kind of decoupling of the um, CO2 emissions from the final energy use. It's still almost entirely oil use. Um, so the CO2 emissions have tracked almost exactly the, uh, the energy use. Uh, we have targets for renewable energy. Um, these are mandatory EU targets. Um, there are our, um, 2020 target is for 16% of all uh, of our um, energy use to come from renewable sources. In 2019, we were only at 12%. So at this stage, it's fairly certain that we're not going to achieve the overall target. Um, there's a fair amount of hope that, uh, you know, good chance we should be able to meet the uh, transport target. Um, and we probably will fall just short of the electricity target uh, of 40%. But heat is the main one where we've fallen short. Um, so it has been very disappointing progress there in the last few years. Um, it's, you know, we're only just about half the, the overall target there. And if there's a single reason why we haven't um, achieved our overall target for renewable energy, it's been the poor progress in, in heat, uh, renewable energy and heat in the past few years. Um, but the, the very significant advantages to um, to promoting renewable energy and to the growth we've seen in renewable energy uh, and uh, you know the main one really is, is of course in avoiding co2 emissions so in 2019 uh, th those renewable energy and heat transfer and electricity avoided uh, just under six million tons of co2 uh, and to put that into some kind of context that's equivalent to about the co2 emissions of 65 percent of all homes in Ireland. so that's a, you know a very significant chunk of, of carbon that was avoided there from these renewables uh, in 2019. I'm conscious that I'm um, running short on time. I, I only put in one or two slides to talk about COVID. So as I said, usually we produce our, our figures, our annual figures, our, all of our main outputs are in, in annual figures. Uh, and the most recent data for that is in 2019. So the provisional figures for 2020 will come out probably the end of next month. But we, because of the, the interesting times that we lived in, um, uh, we did look specifically at some more short-term statistics uh, last year to try and give an indication of what was happening um, to energy use on foot of the, the lockdowns uh, because of COVID. Um, basically, the main impact of COVID has been on transport, which might be expected. Uh, so this shows the um, road diesel um, gross in and deliveries. Uh, monthly throughout the year. So the most recent data is for October. Uh, so we can see the effects of the first lockdown there in April is you know very significant uh, drop in, in diesel energy use. Um, the, the effects of the kind of second and third lockdowns, they weren't uh, visible yet in the, in the data that we have there. Um, 
uh, and then an even more dramatic reduction in jet fuel kerosene. So that's really where the most dramatic uh, reductions have been. Um, as I so showed earlier, you know, aviation is a significant end use of transport energy. Um, and in the summer months there, which is usually the peak for um, aviation use, it was down by almost 90%. So that's really where the, the biggest reduction has been. We've seen um, where transport fuels are down, actually heating oil use is, is gone up. So we saw um, record high levels of heating oil uh, purchases or gross inland deliveries um, at the start of the year. That was probably tied down to a few things. I mean, um, there was actually record low um, oil prices back then. There was a lot of uh, media coverage over the fact that there was negative oil prices on the, on the, the world markets, but I, I, even in the, the retail markets here, there was low oil prices. And then I think people were aware of the fact that we're going into lockdown and there might have been a, an urge to fill up the oil tank with the cheap oil, knowing that we were going into lockdown. So we saw a very high surge in, in heating oil use at the start of the year. Sorry, this isn't actually used. This is just the inland deliveries. So this doesn't say that it's used. It's more just that it was um, distributed out to the, to the main distributors. Um, uh, that's, um, we also look at the shorter term statistics for electricity and gas, and there hasn't been the same kind of impact uh, on electricity and gas use. For instance, electricity was down during the first lockdown, but then uh, in the latter half of the year, particularly in December, we saw record high um, electricity usage uh, at a time where you know everyone was working from home and, and at home, and there was a, a, a cold spell there in December, and potentially there was a lot of people using electricity for supplemental heating. So we saw, um, yeah, a, a new record set there for electricity use, uh, and really there hasn't been a, a big discernible impact of COVID on gas use. Um, but uh, we will have more kind of definitive um, picture of, of how uh, the picture for 2020 has uh, shaped up uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, so again, I'm conscious of time. Thank you very much. Um, again, you can I encourage you to visit our website. You can get all of our key publications there and there's data to download. And um, I'll be, uh, can take questions. I, I think we're gonna keep them till the end. So uh, thank you very much. And um, I can take questions later. I'll stop sharing there. Actually, just while I'm finishing up there, uh, this has been kind of a, a very general uh, overview, I guess, of energy use in Ireland. I'm, I'm aware that the topic of the today is, is specifically on industry energy. It's just to highlight two particular pieces of work that, um, well, one especially that we're working on at the moment that there should be outputs from uh, in the next um, probably two months. Uh, and that's a, a study on heat use in Ireland that will look uh, in a lot of detail at um, the options that there are for decarbonizing heat energy use uh, and we'll look uh, in detail at industry uh, and the, the kind of yeah the options that there are out to 2030 and indeed out to 2050 there um so that's um yeah maybe something to keep an eye out for so thanks very much and i'll, I'll uh, hand back okay so hello everybody uh, my name is uh, alan heenan i'm a senior program program manager within Thorma King and we'll have Wayne Donlan available for questions afterwards who's uh, the lead engineer and over the system design and architecture of, uh, of the project. So first of all today I'm going to talk you through the, the Advancer project. Um, the, the Advancer project recently won um, uh, one of Engineering Ireland's uh, Design Innovation and Sustainability Awards uh, in Q4 uh, last year, and then in December it won um, uh, Project Endeavour of, of, of the Year from Engineers Ireland. So today I'm going to take you through the project and maybe some of the key points about the project, especially around sustainability and, and what, uh, what drove it to be highlighted for, for, for that award. So um, first of all, for, for most people on the call, um, you know, mightn't be too familiar with 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 Thermaking and our products but Thermaking are are the market leaders in in refrigeration uh, uh products transport refrigeration products and the advancer project we're talking about today is a trailer product it goes on the front of um uh your 40 foot uh, uh trailers as as shown in the picture here so most people Thermaking is kind of a brand some people might know it in Galway across the country i'm not so sure but thermoking is is a type of a business and and these products are the type of products that 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 touch your lives without you even knowing it uh, so thermoking are the market leaders in transport refrigeration but every time you open up your your fridge or your freezer uh, or at home um at some point in time in the journey from that food from farm to fork there's a 75 to 80 percent probability 
that uh, that food that you that you grab inside in your fridge or your freezer would have been transported on a Thermal King unit produced in Galway. And that's if you open that fridge anywhere in Ireland, Europe, Africa, Middle East, or Asia. It's all, all uh, 75 days in advance, it came from the, the products produced uh, by Thermal King in, in the west of Ireland, in Galway. So we have a very wide reach in, in, in our industry and in, in our products. Okay, so, so what is the Advancer project and, and, and what did we do and why did we do it? So we had a previous project called the SLX, which is a, a mechanically architectured uh, unit with loads of belts and pulleys and diesel engines and, uh, and, and so forth, right? But we had to move into the future-proof the architecture into a more of electrified architecture and, uh, and, and to a more greener and sustainable solution. As, as Dennis pointed out uh, how road Road freight and, and transport industry is one of the one of the metrics that's going negative, as you've seen, in, in terms of energy consumption and, and CO2 emissions, where there's all, a lot of other industries are making gains. Because of that, um, uh, the EU and uh, are driving a lot of regulation, uh, directives, environmental changes, and are pushing towards uh, electrification. Likewise, you can't turn on your 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 TV um, your TV with, uh, or news without seeing some city on about banning diesel or putting in low emission zones and them emission zones can be everything from noise to 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 diesel to to uh nox to you you name it the directives are coming thick and fast at, at at the transportation industry and because we use a diesel engine in our products we had to try and respond uh, uh respond to those uh, uh regulations coming our ways and we had to go into an electrified architecture to future proof uh, our products uh, and to make them more sustainable and environmentally friendly also like any like any business we had a product that was over 10 years old. It was, it was released in 2008. So we had to, we had to uh, design a, um, um, a more modern unit and to, to fight off increased competition. When you have such a large market share like, like Thermal King has, um, it's much easier to lose share than it is to gain. So we had to make sure we, we, we were constantly innovating with uh, some premium products. So what Thermal King did about five years ago is they, they invested uh, heavily in accelerating um, and their R and D development on on its electrified portfolio, so these projects, especially these heavy engineering projects, they they don't they don't happen overnight. This was probably a, a five year journey to to develop a unit like this. The best way to describe the unit in terms of its size is almost like a, a, a it's almost like a car from chassis to engines to belts to pulleys to skins to from an engineering perspective, it's it's at that scale. So we were trying to design a, a car to a, an electrified vehicle in, in, in five years. So that's the scale of the, of, of the project. And it took tens of millions of dollars to, 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 to do that. And the result was the, the Advancer product. And it is now being, being regarded widely in the industry as the most uh, sustainable and, and environmentally friendly uh, trailer uh, uh, refrigeration unit uh, in the market. And you'll see some of the stats associated with that as we go through the presentation. So when we looked at this project, and when we looked at sustainability at its core and electrification at its core, we looked at it in, in, in two areas. We looked at it from the product itself and trying to minimize the, the uh, increase the efficiency and, and sustainability from, a, from a, a user perspective in the product. But likewise, we also held ourselves in Thermal King to the same, uh, to the same level of accountability in our manufacturing processes. So we, 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 attacked, we attacked the sustainability and environmentally friendliness on, on both fronts, product and manufacturing. So I'll talk you through, uh, first of all, what we did uh, uh, on the product side. So, we started off with 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 the, with the vision of going to a more electrified architecture. So that's that's the center of of, of, of the infographic you see there. But like 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 with any um, like with any product, um, you can have ambitions to go electrified, but you still have to create a value proposition that the customer will still pay for. Environmentally friendliness, sustainability is all good and well, but but uh, when you're asking someone to pay for a product, there has to be a return on investment, and they have to uh, see the value in 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 the rest of the value proposition. So we started off with with an electrified architecture as as the core, but once you talk about electrified architectures, the the the, the types of designs are 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 pretty much uh, endless from from a component level. 
So before we jumped in and says, right, let's design an electrified architecture, we first went all the way back to say, what are the product needs and what are the product attributes that can deliver those needs? So then when we identify the attributes, we says, okay, what are the types of technologies that would deliver those attributes? So an example for if you say, oh, you want, you want uh, airflow, right? You can have many different types of designs of fans and airflows and voltages and different parameters. When you talk about noise, right? You can say, oh, I want a quiet unit, but then you have to look product uh, component by component to say, well, well, what, what component will give you the quietest uh, 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 noise uh, uh, for, for, for that given uh, technology, right? So you start off with the customer needs, product attributes, product at attributes, what technologies will give you those attributes. Then we summed up different, different uh, building blocks of all those different technologies. And we, 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 we ranked them to see, well, which, which products gives us the best value proposition. So again, it was about not jumping in to say, oh, we're going to go for the most environmentally friendly or the most um, uh, fuel efficiency. We, we had to strike a balance between, between all the technologies to give us the, to give us the optimum result. So what, what, what that looked like, we, we went with what was called a 48-fold DC mild hybrid architecture. So I'll let Wayne answer questions at the end about the, the details of that. But in essence, we, we looked at one of the drivers for this. It was deemed the most efficient way to give us stuff like variable airflow. We looked at cost. Cost is also very important. Um, and we looked at, when we looked at, uh, AC and EC technologies and DC technologies. And we, we strike, try to strike a balance between efficiency, cost, where they were on their technology roadmaps, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, we went with this low voltage uh, DC um, technology. It also helped us because in the future, we see the likes of axle generators uh, and, and, and large scale, maybe 20, 30 kilowatt uh, uh, lithium ion battery um, support or battery packs on, on trailers. So we wanted a technology that wasn't just good for today, but that could be easily uh, upgraded in the future for these uh, when these technologies become more readily available. So in other words, we wanted them to be power agnostic, no matter where the power came from. So that's why we chose this architecture. So that's the center block of our of our um, of our, our electric architecture chosen. So then we looked at the value proposition around and tried to see how we can get maximum efficiency uh, 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 um, out of each each area. So the first thing, obviously, because we're a transport refrigeration uh, company, right? So therefore, temperature control and, uh, and and airflow is one of the key the key building blocks. So we looked at things to try and help uh, help drive efficiency. So we maximize the size of our condenser and our vaps. They're like the lungs of our units, right? So then we looked at our, our engine and we tried to see how could we make our engine more efficient, right? Because obviously the more efficient your engine is, the less the less um, 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 fuel it takes to, to burn and the more greener you are. Uh, we looked at how you can make the unit smarter so you can control it easier. Um, we design our units to, to ship everywhere from Scandinavia, where you see minus 40, right? Or, or Siberia minus 50, even sometimes to, 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 to the opposite end in Dubai and Saudi Arabia, where you see plus 50. So before we used to design one unit to try and compensate uh, all those different environments. Um, but what we try to do with Advancer is, is, is tune them to, to different, with, with smarter controls to different regions. So therefore you can, you can easily adapt it. So you can make it more efficient rather than having the one, the one setting in all regions, it had it, had it uh, easily changeable. So you can maximize efficiency for your region and for your usage, right? So that was on the, the temperature control. So after we did all that, we built in all this efficiency, right? We actually got one of the most efficient um, refrigeration units, whilst also being having the fastest pull down. That means getting the temperature down to your set point of minus 20 with the best airflow and the tightest temperature control. Imagine a 40 foot container and you can, you can, you can, you can manage the temperature to 0.2 of a degree, 0.1 in some cases, right? So if you think this in, in terms of a car, it'd be like, um, getting the most fuel efficient car with the, with the highest horsepower. So it's very unusual that you get both, but we got that because we, we, we believe we chose the, 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 the right uh, electrified architecture. So the next one then is on fuel efficiency. So um, fuel efficiency came from 
our controls and our airflow as well, but it also came from our engine. We moved to what was called a, a, an inner MIM compliant engine, which is, uh, we're not exactly on the same, like the tier four, tier five, tier six, which are truck bodies are it's a different regulation that we're we're complying to but we had to comply to this new engine regulation which was lowering the the, the, the kilowatt uh, output of it but we also went from what was called a mechanically governed engine which was a simple almost like um like like it was a two speed it was almost like a, a mechanical pulley that was given either high speed or low speed and it was very very inefficient where we went to an electronically governed engine like you'd have in your car where it has multiple engine speeds, it's able to manage the highs and the lows much more easier. You're able to tune it much better. And even just that simple change gained serious, um, um, much better efficiency in terms of our fuel consumption. Uh, we're also the first, which, which is hard to believe, to, to measure fuel just like your car. So you can measure how much uh, fuel you spent delivering your, 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 your product or 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 how much fuel you've used in a week and so on and so forth. You'd imagine that's simple technology, but in our industry, it wasn't there before. Um, and we also did a thing when our previous product where we had mechanical belts and pulleys, everything was linked to the engine speed. So if you wanted more airflow, you had to up the engine speed. If you wanted less airflow, you had to drop the engine speed. But when we went to electrified architecture, we decoupled that. So, so it made it much more efficient. So what does that actually mean in figures, right? So in terms of figures, we've reduced our fuel consumption versus the competition by over 30%. So that's like buying your car today versus tomorrow and saving 30% on fuel efficiency. That's a transformational leap in our industry. It equates to about a thousand euro uh, in fuel saving uh, per customer or per, 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 per haulage company per unit sold. So if you put that into perspective for a transport refrigeration industry that, uh, that's making profits in around single digit profits or single digit OI, a thousand euro per vehicle they have on the road saving every year in fuel is, is significant. And a bit like Dennis, Dennis showed there, we're on a negative trend in terms of CO2 usage as an industry. And this product is showing a 30% decline in fuel. So that's, 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 that's quite significant uh, uh, for, for our industry. Then um in, in terms of the next step was how do you make it power agnostic so we, we we went with a mild hybrid which means we still have an engine but we're electrified architecture but what we've also done is we've made the unit because it's it's, it's that mild hybrid unit we also can take shore power which means if a trailer is plugged in or at a depot and it's, it's plugged in overnight or stay overnight, it can be plugged in uh, to a three-phase plug and it can take power from, from, from the grid. So you're not having to use your engine. We also can take power from, from uh, the, the tractor body through a hybrid uh, uh, inverter system. And it's also power agnostic as when the technologies come along with axle generators, it'll be able to take that power. And when, when battery packs come along, it'll also be able to take that power. So we've not only created a, a design an electrified mild hybrid design for today, but we've designed it for tomorrow that it'll be able to take that power in whichever form that, 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 that it comes in. Then where that really helps is, um, is in Europe, um, there's these things called ULEZs, ultra low emission zones. So you often hear, if any of you ever travel through London, you'll see these ULEZ zones once you go into the center of London. So there are tax that you pay if you drive into the city centre. But some of, the, some of these ULEZs are, 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 are fines and taxes that, that you have to pay. And some of them are outright bans if you don't have the right diesel engine or, or, or if you exceed certain noise levels. So we've been landscaping all these uh, uh, regulations and all these ULEZs. And based off our electrified architecture, but also based on being able to be power agnostic, switching from diesel to tractor power to axle generators and so on and so forth. We, we believe uh, our product, the Advancer, is, is future-proofed um, to such an effect that we're, we don't fear um, Madrid or Paris going off and implementing uh, um, um, a given ULEZ uh, regulation because we think our, our unit is, we, we've covered our bases with this unit to, 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 to be able to adapt quickly. To, to these changes, which was um, an, important, uh, an important design aspect. So then when we talk about environmental and, and sustainability, 
obviously one of the most uh, 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 pollutant gases out there is, is, is refrigerants, right? It, 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 it has a very high global warming potential. And as a refrigeration company, um, and we use a lot of refrigerate, uh, refrigerant in our products. So we, we, when we looked at sustainability, it was just, wasn't just from a fuel perspective. We also had to try and reduce, um, reduce our, our, uh, our, our, our refrigerant uh, GWP. Uh, so we put a lot of effort into changing out our refrigerant. The industry commonly uses uh, R4048, which has a GWP of about 4,000. That's pretty much in line with where the regulation is at today. But our Thermaking units, uh, we, we, we worked in partnership with some refrigerant suppliers and, 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 and we developed uh, this uh, R452 refrigerant, which is half uh, uh, the regulation. It's about 2,000 GWP. So we did that as a first step. Uh, so we halved our 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 our, our emissions in that in that in that respect. But again, just like we talked about the power agnostic uh, design of our unit, we also designed um, our unit to be able to take future refrigerants. So we're always looking at at, at further developing refrigerants, and and we, we're looking at the unit is able to go as low as as uh, as, as three hundred. So that's like an over a ninety percent uh, reduction in 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 uh, in GWP uh, uh, savings in terms of sustainability. Um, yes. So then then the next one is when people talk about emissions. I mentioned it earlier. So you have fuel emissions. You can have global warming potential of refrigerants, but then you also have noise. Right. That's also an emission that the EU is taking very seriously, and these uh, ultra low emission uh, uh, zones in, in cities are taken very seriously, and it affects us uh, more than more than most because um, uh, in cities uh, in ultra low emission zones, um, there are certain directives that if you're over a certain decibel level, uh, you can't deliver after 8 p.m. at night or or or, or before 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, uh, an example of that would be if you were living in an apartment and you were on the first or the second floor of that apartment and you had a very noisy refrigeration unit that's generally placed quite high uh, off the ground and, 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 and you're at six o'clock in the morning, you hear this very loud diesel engine humming or, or this very loud noise coming from a refrigeration unit, uh, it's not very welcome, right? So uh, we, we worked very hard to design uh, in as much acoustic improvements into our units as possible. and. Um, so we, we ended up designing the, the, um, the quietest uh, uh, transport refrigeration unit in the market. And we also have models that are what's called peak compliant, which means it can be used for deliveries 24 hours a day. Um, the, 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 the decibel level we got our units down to in electric mode and even in diesel mode actually is below 60 decibels. To put that into perspective, I'm probably talking louder than 60 decibels here today and office space would be just floating around 60 decibels in terms of uh, uh, noise. So that's that's the type of level we got our, 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 our unit down to in terms, of, uh, uh, in terms of noise. And then the final area we looked at then was around smart uh, control. So nowadays, uh, people don't just buy a piece of hardware like a refrigeration unit. They want all the intelligence to go with it because data is king now and uh, uh, what, what gets measured gets managed. And um, so we we attack we attack this in two ways. So the first thing we did is we we developed a, a brand new uh, a brand new controller. Um, so we went more or less comparing to our old one. We almost went from a, a Nokia fifty two ten to a an iPhone in terms of our in terms of our control, in terms of our logic, in terms of our our processing power, our smart, or the data we're pulling from the unit. And we also went to a kind of a more icon based rather than a an all, almost a monochrome text based uh, control system. So what that control system does is it, it, it's starting taking a lot more data from our unit. And we're able to use that data to, to make the unit more efficient because we're able to get access to, to all the data of all the thousands of tens of thousands of units uh, around the world. And we're able to mine that data and see what can we do to make the unit more efficient? What profiles can we program into units to make them more efficient? So data is helping us do that. And the next thing we're, we're trying to do, or next thing we did is we integrated telematics as standard. So you're able to see where your unit is, you're able to see what fuel is burning, you're able to see what temperature um, and the unit is run that your driver is able to control the unit with, 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 your, with your smartphone. Um, that information is fed back to, to the customer and they know when, a bit like your, your DHL delivery, when your 
when your when your product is arriving and so forth, right? So it's all about that data, telematics, connectivity, and 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 smartness. So so that's how we that's how we 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 try to develop uh, uh, the the sustainability and the environment uh, environmental improvements into the into the product. Okay, so that's kind of the the the, the first half of of our sustainability journey. Okay, the, the, the next half was, okay, so we've made a product now that's sustainable, but we have to hold ourselves uh, and our own business to, to the same level of, of accountability. So we looked at a target, just like as a design, we wanted electrification as the center core of our, of our mission. Uh, for, for, um, for, for the manufacturing side, we wanted to be carbon neutral. I think the goal was to be the first uh, carbon neutral, neutral uh, assembly line uh, in Ireland. And, and considering that we're, we're heavy industry, heavy mechanical industry, um, that, that was a, a pretty big, uh, ambitious goal that uh, we tried to go after. So how did we do that? Well, the first thing we did was we actually focused on trying to reduce, before we even looked at what energy we're looking at and what sources of energy, we says, right, the first thing to do is let's actually go after and make the unit easier to manufacture, okay? So if you make your unit easier to manufacture and, and have less parts and, and, and less brazing and less welding and, 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 and so forth, you automatically get a reduction in your energy consumption. Before you even look at replacing, we we'll say dirty energy to clean energy, if you just naturally make the reduction first in, in, in the amount of energy you need to produce, um, um, then that's what, that was our first step. So we did everything from, we reduced the number of wells from 13 meters to eight meters. We reduced the number of parts from, from 970 to just over 500. We reduced uh, the number of brazing joints by 35%. Um, the list goes on. And, and that, that gave us a natural, uh, a natural um, uh, benefit in terms of our energy consumption in a factory. So the, the net effect of all that was, we we reduce uh, we reduced our um, our labor to build our unit by thirty percent, but we reduce the energy to consume or to 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 to, to build your unit by sixty percent. Okay, so we've taken away sixty percent of the problem before we actually went attacking the the sources of 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 the energy. So that was that was the first step we we looked at. The next step we looked at then was we tried to just like we did with our unit to get smarter with our controls and our telematics. The next thing we did on our on our on our on our manufacturing side is try to try to do something similar. So we we implemented um, a lot of automation. Uh, um, we implemented um, um, a lot of uh, um, robotics. We we replaced. Uh, we implemented the likes of AGVs where we automate, automate guided vehicles, where instead of having gas fork trucks, we have these electrified uh, mini uh, low energy uh, AGVs delivering our, our material around the factory. Um, we, also, we also made this factory, uh, tr we'll try to make our, a journey to being a more smart factory, implementing internet of things, energy management systems, um, um, manufacturing execution systems, MES systems, and, and so forth. So again, it was about knowing uh, the energy we're using in the factory, trying to gather that data, monitor it, see where we're exceeding. And, and again, it's once we know where we're using all the energy and, 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 and managing that, we can, we can put processes in place to improve it on, uh, on a daily basis. So that was the, that was the second step um, we did. The third step then was now that we have reduced our labor content by 60%, now that we've made our units smarter, our, 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 our manufacturing process smarter, we now then went after, right, with 40% uh, uh, energy left, what are we going to do about that? So we looked at everything from converting our, 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 all our electricity to green sources. We looked at moving from moving to natural gas. We looked at moving our brazing gas to bio LPG. We have it. We test. We test our units with diesel at the end of our our, our 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 assembly line for like forty minutes. We're looking at moving from diesel to to HVO biodiesel to test our units. We obviously did the simple things like replace all our our lights to LED. We replaced on our line all our compressed air tools. From we, we did a we did a study 
compare compressed air tools to 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 power tools like your Dewalls, but maybe the higher tech version of the walls, but all electrified power tools to so remove compressed air because that was that was a high consumption of, of, of energy. We also did things like we've zero landfill for a factory the size of Galway with hundreds of people. We've zero landfill. It's 100 percent recyclable uh, in, in our factory. And we also have all our water uh, uh, harvested on site. All our water usage is, is harvested on site. So again, we looked at our 40 percent energy. We looked at left. 40% left of energy and we says we looked at every single line and how can we make this um, um, uh, more renewable and sustainable from from uh, from a factory standpoint. And then maybe on a side note, which which doesn't really get an awful lot of um, uh, spotlight, maybe when, when measuring these things. Um, but Thermo King is is a company that designs the unit itself. It has its own R&D facility in, in Galway where it does all the design and it does all the final assembly manufacture, right? But the, the subcomponents are pretty much all sourced uh, uh, in, by tier one suppliers. It's very similar actually to the automotive industry in, in, in that respect. So we design it, but their contract manufactured all the subcomponents. So we, we, we have made a big effort to, um, to increase the, the, the percentage of our, our, our supply base that came from, from uh, from uh, region, in region sourcing. So there was a big push maybe about a decade ago to, to try and go low cost sourcing in, in India and China and Southeast Asia and, and Mexico and the likes. Uh, but over the course of the last few years, um, um, it's actually become an, um, uh, uh, financially actually, and as well as sustain sustainable wise, um, as competitive to source from Europe anymore. A lot of the major companies have gone more into automation and uh, and and the cost of logistics is is uh, is is is, is kind of on, on an upward trend, so that all coupled together, we increased our, our EU supply base, both in Ireland and in 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 the EU pulling parts from 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 Asia. So that in itself has reduced our, our carbon put, footprint if we look at our in to in supply chain. So this is going a step further. This is product manufacturing and going a step further into our supplier base. So we're looking at trying to reduce our, our, our carbon footprint uh, uh, in that respect. And actually, one of the side benefits, I know it's not really to do with sustainability, but we actually did actually make a strategic decision to avoid sourcing from the UK due to the Brexit concerns, currency concerns, uh, uh, supply concerns. So uh, actually, Ireland... Uh, uh, would would have been a winner from from that decision. So about about thirty to thirty five to thirty eight percent, I think, of all our 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 our, our product, uh, our suppliers are coming from the island of Ireland, uh, which is which is actually quite high for 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 our industry to have that percentage coming locally. So that's that's another uh, side advantage. Okay, so I've talked you through the sustainability and uh, from a product and a manufacturing, but what does it what does it mean in numbers? So from, from a product perspective, the improvements and the efficiencies that, that we have delivered um, um, from the Advancer product equates to about three tons of CO2 per, per unit per year. Uh, so that's the equivalent of planting 50 trees for every single unit sold every single year. To put that into perspective, we make uh, one of these units about every five and a half minutes uh, in the Galway factory. So that'd be like someone out the back planting 50 trees every five and a half minutes. It'd be, it's struggle to keep up. But uh, I think um, in, 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 when you see it presented like that, it shows the impact that, that these, uh, these projects can really have on the environment. Then, then from a manufacturing perspective, um, we're, we're on track to become the, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, manufacturing line in our company, Train Technologies, but also in Ireland to become uh, fully uh, carbon neutral. And uh, again, uh, that should read 60% reduction in energy to assemble 300 tonnes of CO2 from a factory perspective, uh, saving every year, which is about, again, about 4,500 trees from a saving per year from a, from a, a, a Galway plant uh, perspective. So I know there was a lot of slides and I, I went very quickly, but uh, uh, that's, that concludes uh, um, my presentation. 